Hi, I'm Mike Coates. I've been a volunteer at the Old Low Light Heritage Centre since it opened six years ago, where I've given various talks. As part of our series of lockdown talks, this is a shortened version of my Powerburn talk, how this now hidden tributary of the River Tyne influenced the origin of North Shields, Clifford's Fort, St Leonard's Hospital and Northumberland Park. As a boy growing up playing in Northumberland Park, I was not aware of the name Powburn. Pow is an old English term for a slow running stream. We called the area of the park Spitaldean, but again I didn't know why it was called that. The Powburn originated in an area called the Mosses, where Marden and Preston Grange Estates are now, ran through what is now the golf course, the park, down Tanner's Bank and into the Tyne in the Fish Quay. When in 2009, North Tyneside Council applied to the Heritage Lottery Fund for money to regenerate Northumberland Park and restore lost historical features, the council asked me, with my local knowledge, to accompany a team from the Heritage Lottery Fund around the park to identify and describe the lost historical features. After the funding was approved, I was asked by the Heritage Lottery Fund to produce a written history of the park and surrounding area. I started researching the Powerburn after reading in some disbelief the Governor's Tree plaque which stated the Powerburn was navigable so far from the river. I then read that when John Richardson in 1765 established the tannery in the Pew Dean, the area was a tidal salt marsh and the Powerburn was navigable for half a mile. A fellow volunteer at the Heritage Centre who has an allotment on the north side of Tanner's Bank near where the tannery stood, told me the deeds for this area of land, dated in the 1700s, state the owner may unload his catch from his boat here, but not leave it moored overnight. Also, an article in the local press of 1861 said the cemetery, which existed in the 16th century, was formed long after the tidal wave had ceased to reach the altitude of its banks. The Spittle was one of the burial places in Tynemouth Parish, and the parish register records the first burial here in 1656 and the last in 1714. William Linskull, who owned land in Spitaldean, wrote in 1885 that before the removal of the gravestones, they stretched from the pond at the end of Squire's Walk, which is where the pet cemetery is now, across to Mrs Morris's cottage. I began to think how the Powerburn had created the valley and provided fresh water for the industry that developed in the Dean and created a safe anchorage where North Shields originated. The question was how big the burn had been 500 years or more earlier before surrounding areas were drained and water diverted. Looking at the width of the valley from the top of Brewhouse Bank to the west and Riverview to the east gives an indication and the fact that the golf course is so much lower than Northumberland Park shows how the topography has altered over the centuries. Before the piers were built, the first shelter from the North Sea was behind Priors Point, where Clifford's Fort was built, the haven being open to rough seas, and before the piers were built, the walls of Clifford's Fort were breached by stormy seas at least five times in the early 1800s. This convenient mooring place at the mouth of the River Tyne was recorded used by the Roman general Agricola in 83 AD and there is a suggestion of a quay running up the west side of the Powburn as in 1819 when workmen were excavating to build a gasometer at a salt marsh in the Powdean at a depth of 12 feet they found large oak beams pinned with wooden nails resembling wharfs with mussel beds under, where ships drawing nine or ten feet of water could come. On this 1861 map, showing the gasometer, I have outlined the present fish key in white, and shown the extent of the possible harbour previously here. It's not unreasonable to presume that the Romans, who were expert engineers, could have created such a harbour. North Shields originated in 1225, when the Tynemouth prior, Germanus, reclaimed marshy ground where the Powburn entered the Tyne and gave permission for seven shields to be built here, on consideration of providing fish to the monastery. 
As time passed, merchants realised the benefit of this first safe harbour near the sea, and North Shields grew along the river bank. It's recorded that when aldermen from Newcastle came to visit Tynemouth, they would use the Powerburn to disembark from their state barges. Where the Powerburn enters the Tyne, it created a deeper water basin where ships could lie awaiting high tide, and this was known as Peggy's Hole, after the naval press gang ship Peggy, which used to come here. In the Low Lights area, over 800 people lived in this densely populated area. There were at least nine public houses, a windmill, and many businesses called after the area, such as the Low Lights Tavern, the Low Lights Baths, the Low Lights Pottery, the Low Lights Chemical Works, and the Low Lights Salt Works. This illustration of a bridge is actually the Ooseburn at Newcastle, but presumably the bridge at the Low Lights would have been similar. Like the Seaton Burn in Hollywell Dean, which is a small stream at low tide, but at high tide the water depth doubles, enabling small boats to travel upstream. In 1758, John Richardson, a Quaker leather manufacturer from Whitby, came and rented from John Walker, a family friend who had the largest house in Dockery Square, land in the Pew Dean. He drained the former salt marsh which flooded at high tide and built his tannery and family home. Later, the Tyne Dean Sawmill, Guana Works and Electrical Power Station were built on this site. Now the only mention of the Dean is on this sign. Also, by the 1800s, a brewery, salt manufacturers, lime kiln and iron foundry and pottery were utilising the sheltered Dean and fresh water supplied by the Power Burn. The low light pottery was owned by John Carr from 1834 and his son Thomas rented four acres in the Spitaldean in 1862 from the Duke of Northumberland and built greenhouses, a vinery and a peach house, a croquet lawn and gardens there. An article in the Tyne Mercury dated the 17th of October 1815 stated, On Michaelmas Day, the new road from Tynemouth Castle Gates to Newcastle over the Powdeen Mound, a large mound of earth recently laid across a deep valley near Tynemouth Barracks, was opened for carriages, and now coaches and gigs travel almost in a direct line from Baker Hill to Tynemouth, shortening the distance considerably. King Edward Road was straightened and raised in 1922, meaning the Dirt Dean was now divided by these two roads. Before this, the majority of the Dean, from the tannery north to Preston Village, was still open arable grazing land. The Spittle Dean Farm was built in 1784. The first lease shows an annual rent to the Duke of £132. The farm buildings were probably built with stone from the nearby derelict St Leonard's Hospital. The farm buildings and land were taken over by the golf course on its formation in 1912, the old cart house now housing golf buggies. On the eastern boundary of the farm stood the Spittle Dean Mill, also called Tynemouth Mill, and on the 1851 census George Nellis, a farmer, was living there. Later, called Tomling Mill, Ralph Tomling died there in 1903. In 1839, the Tyne Pilot magazine published letters suggesting providing public gardens in Spitaldean. The poor people of the town had been shut from the fields and only had the seashore to visit for recreation, being no right to roam in those days. John Foster Spence, who had been mayor three times in the late 1800s, saw the benefit of this proposal creating a local amenity and also to provide work for the unemployed. He liaisoned with the Duke of Northumberland's agent in 1884 and it was agreed the land would be gifted if the council dealt with compensation for the Duke's tenants in the Dean. These were a rope works, tripe house, Morris's garden, Carr's greenhouse and gardens and William Linskill's grazing land. Mrs Morris had a market garden and lived in Spittle Dean in the cottage built in 1862, which was later lived in by the park's head gardener. Mr Carr's greenhouse, peach house and vinery, workman's cabin and gardens were also incorporated in the park on its creation in 1885. Then, on the 11th of August 1885, 
with local banks shut and multitudes gathered, including the mayors of North Shields, Newcastle, Gateshead and South Shields, and with brass bands dancing and singing, the Duke of Northumberland formally opened the park, gifted for the enjoyment of the people of Shields. 130 years later, in August 2015, after the park had been closed for 18 months for regeneration and reinstating of historical features, it was reopened with over 10,000 members of the public present, the playing field never having had so many children on it before. After assisting the council and the Heritage Lottery Fund for six years on the regeneration project, I was rewarded and privileged to be asked to escort the Mayor of North Tyneside and the Duchess of Northumberland around the park on its official reopening. More than 500 years previously, however, the Dean had seen much different serene activity at the St Leonard's Leper Hospital. Here about a dozen monks in black robes would have been seen at up to eight prayer events each day, as well as tending farm animals and crops and administering to the sick. This map of 1678 shows the nearby Spittal Bridge and St Leonard's was first recorded in an assize roll of 1293, mentioning the bridge of the Hospital of St Leonard's. King Henry I, after the year 1100, encouraged ecclesiastical reform and the provision of leper hospitals and Tynemouth Monastery was rebuilt in this period. Perhaps the same stonemasons who rebuilt the monastery were also responsible for building the elaborate church building of St Leonard's, discovered during the archaeological dig in the park from the years 2012 to 2015. The route to Tynemouth's Market, held from 1275, crossed the bridge over the Pow Burn, and this was responsible for the hospital's situation. Other St Leonard's hospitals at Annick and Mitford were also on main transport routes by a bridge over a river where money could be begged for income to maintain the hospital. Then in 1539, Henry VIII dissolved Tynemouth Monastery and Spittal Close was surrendered to the Crown and the land passed to the Duke of Northumberland in 1637. During the archaeological investigation, elaborate stonework dating from the Norman period was identified, meaning the hospital was older than previously believed and occupied for at least 500 years with a religious community living in the Dean. A tiled floor, carved stonework and leaded windows proved this had been an impressive church visible from the mouth of the Tyne and Tynemouth Priory, as illustrated in this sketch drawn by one of the archaeologists, as it may have looked at a time even before North Shields existed. However, alluding to much earlier occupation of the Dean was the finding of a 5,000-year-old Neolithic stone axe and flint tools on the strategically secure high ground and with fresh water supplied by the power burn on two sides may well have been the site of a Stone Age settlement. These last pictures show the culvert through which the power burn now flows into the park from the golf course and although it is also culverted under the golf course valley after heavy rain it sometimes reappears on the surface just as it would have run across the Spittal farm long before any of us walked in the Dean. I hope you now agree with me that the power burn was an important tributary of the Tyne. Thank you. <laughs>